Virgin Mary had a baby boy. The Virgin Mary. He comes from the glory, He comes from the glorious kingdom, He comes from the glory, He comes from the glorious kingdom. Oh yes, believer, oh yes, believer, He comes from the glory. He comes from the glorious kingdom. The angel sang, was a baby born. The angel sang, was a baby born. The angel sang, was a baby born. I proclaim the mystery of Jesus. He comes from the glory. He comes from the glorious kingdom. He comes from the glory, He comes from the glorious kingdom. Oh yes, believer, oh yes, believer. He comes from the glory, He comes from the glorious kingdom. Shepherds came where the baby boy. The shepherds came with a baby boy. The shepherds came with a baby boy. And they said that his name was Jesus. He comes from the glory. He comes from the glorious kingdom. He comes from the glory. He comes from the glorious kingdom. Oh yes, believer. Oh yes, believer. He comes from the glory. He comes from the glorious kingdom. The wise men saw where the baby born. The wise men saw where the baby born. The wise men saw where the baby born. And they say that his name was Jesus. He comes from the glory. He comes from the glorious kingdom. He comes from the glory. He comes from the glorious kingdom. Oh, yes, believer. Oh, yes, believer. He comes from the glory, He comes from the glorious kingdom. Amen. Amen. He comes from the glorious kingdom. Amen. Our next song is hymn number 142, and we're going to ask you please to sing along. Him one four two. Amen. Angels we have heard on high singing sweetly through the night, and the mountains in reply echo with their great delight.
Shepherds, why this jubilee? Why these songs of happy cheer? What great brightness did you see? What glad tidings did you hear? No. Please stand. Come, Holy Spirit, we need thee. Come, sweet Spirit, we pray. Come in your strength and your power. Come in your own gentle way. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for this Sabbath day. Thank you for having given us another day of life. Thank you for the love of Jesus Christ. Thank you for salvation. And at this moment, while we meet and congregate in this here, your house, we're asking you, Lord, that your presence will be with us, that it will be in our hearts, that our hearts will be connected with you and with each other, that we may be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen. Good morning again, everyone. Welcome. Welcome. We're small in number today. We're few in number today, but we can make a joyful noise to the Lord, right? Amen. Happy Sabbath, everybody, and I hope you all had a wonderful week. Um, and if not a wonderful week, 
Um, if it wasn't the greatest week, then at least we grew closer to the Lord in whatever instances or ever experiences we've had this week. We'd like to welcome our speaker for today, Elder John Hakasamana. Am I pronouncing that correctly, Elder? Okay, great. And he's coming all the way from Lake Nelson to be with us today. May God be praised in his message today that he has for us. Do we have any visitors, anyone worshiping with us today for the first time? I don't think so. I think we have um, some of our regular visitors and some of our members here, and I'd like to welcome everybody, and I hope you get a blessing with today's message. Um, we'll have um, um, uh, Sister Debbie come up uh, for our opening hymn this morning. will be number 516 all the way. Amen. Everyone, please stand for the open song. All the way my Savior leads me, what a I to ask beside. Can I doubt his tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, hear my faith in him to dwell. For I know what every for me, Jesus doeth all things well. For I know what every for me, Jesus doeth all things well. All the way my Savior leads me, cheers each winding path I tread, gives me grace for every trial, feeds me with the living bread. Though my weary steps may falter, and my soul at first may be, Rushing from the rock before me, lo, a spring of joy I see. Rushing from the rock before me, lo, a spring of joy I see. All the way my Savior leads me, oh, the fullness of his love. Perfect rest to me is promised in my Father's house above. When I wait to life be mortal, wing my flight to realms of day, this my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. This my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. Amen. 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 So we have, I guess we have the children all prepared up here for the children's story, right? Looks like you guys are all set, right? So Elder Judith is going to uh, tell us, give us the children's story this morning. So let's get to that. Uh, last year, 
Thank you, Elder Judith, for that story. Technology is wonderful when it works, isn't it? <laughs> when it doesn't, you know, that, that's what rules the world now, right? Okay, now is time for our praise and testimony and prayer request time. Is there anyone that um, has a word of praise, a word of testimony, or a prayer request that they would like to share with the congregation this morning? 
We have some um, from Sabbath School that I'm going to uh, bring and um, pray over today. Uh, from Sabbath School, we have, Sis we have Elder Judith, who um, has a friend of hers that unfortunately passed this week. We want to pray for Ruth's family. Um, Ruth passed uh, with uh, suffering from cancer um, this week. Um, Sister Tracy had requested that we continue to pray for her husband, Alan, who had some um, health issues and is now changing, has now changed his lifestyle and has lost quite a bit of weight in six weeks. And um, we pray that he will continue on this lifestyle journey, this positive lifestyle journey, and Tracy will be a helper to him in that. We want to lift up also Elder Aston as he continues uh, to heal. And we want to lift up Sister Anne Marie too as she continues to minister both to Elder Aston and also to her mother, who is living with them as well. Um, let's lift up Sister Tracy Watkins, who is um, still recovering from a cancer as well. Any others? Sister Eunice, good morning. Amen. 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 You sorry for what? What was the sign for? Amen. Amen. And and we are happy that you're here, Sister Eunice. You must have needed the sleep. That's what happens, right? You must have needed the sleep. Amen. Amen. Ha, <laughs> 
<laughs> Amen. Uh, Sister Madeline, when is the big one? What what month? July fifteenth is the big one. Next year, right, right, right. July 15th, Sister Debbie, is that the big one? Okay, okay, we've got to mark that on our calendar. Yeah. <laughs> you know, for my, my mom's 80th, she has a twin sister. We had a big party at my house with um, her and her twin sister and the whole families and everything. It was very memorable. I bought, I had pictures, posters done for them with their baby pictures on there and all of that stuff, so it was memorable. So that is a memorable birthday, so we'll look forward to that. <laughs> oh, so you you've told your family what you want, huh? <laughs> amen, amen. Uh, anyone else? Any other praise? Any other testimonies or prayer requests this morning? Okay, everyone, let's kneel where we're able to, and we will sing our song. Sister Debbie, can you lead us in that song? No, no, no. You could stay there. You could stay there, but. Oh, okay. That one. Now, dear Lord, as we pray, take our hearts and minds far away from the press of the world all around. To your throne where grace does abound. May our lives be transformed by your love. May our souls be refreshed from above. At this moment, let people everywhere Join us now as we come to you in prayer. Amen. Amen. Lord, we come to the Sabbath day with praise and thanksgiving. You heard the praises and the testimonies that were uttered a few minutes ago and, of, and those that were uttered during our Sabbath school time today. We ask you to hear those requests and all the unspoken ones with your blessings and according to your will. Lord, there were praise, uh, praises uttered up to you in thanks for health and for traveling mercies. Um, there were um, also uh, Sister Maudlin asks, gives you some praise and thanks you for being able to move around. The simple joys that we have for being able to do the things that we sometimes take for granted. Lord, we thank you and we, we ask that we will never take those gifts that you've given us for granted. Be able to, the, the ability to enjoy the simple things in life, the simple pleasures that you've given us. Be grateful for all of the gifts that you've given us. We thank you for the wonderful lessons you have opened up to us in Sabbath school to call our attention to end time deceptions. While, the un, uh, while unbiblical, the world tends to look at these as very normal, as we were talking about this morning. We ask you to continually impress the truth upon us so we will not be caught up in these deceptions of the enemy. We ask for a blessing for our families, for our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, for our church, and for our church family. Please keep us united, and may, and may your goals for our church be our goals as well. Lord, you heard some prayers that were lifted up today. Uh, Sister Eunice has asking for, thank you um, for all you've done in her life, and also, Lord, um, asks you to pave the way for her so that she can um, have this change in job that she's looking for, this upgrade in the job that she's looking for, Lord, uh, so she can work less hours. Please hear her prayer on that. We ask a blessing for Sister for Ruth's family. Elder Judith had requested prayer for her friend Ruth's family. Um, Ruth passed this week, Lord. We pray that you will comfort both Elder Judith, who lost a friend, and also Ruth's family. 
Lord, that may this experience bring them closer to you. We ask a blessing for Tracy, our sister Tracy, this morning, um, and how she ministers to Alan. We thank you how you've brought Alan. Uh, you've given him sort of a wake-up call on his health, Lord, and we pray that, and we thank you, Lord, that he has responded to that call and um, is changing his lifestyle. Please and continue to impress upon him to keep that habit going and that lifestyle change going, and, and Tracy also as she administers to him. We want to lift up praise to, we want to lift up your praises, Lord, and ask for blessing and continued healing for Elder Aston, Lord. And uh, please continue to heal him as he recovers from his illness. And we also ask for a blessing for Sister Anne Marie and the rest of their family as they administer to Elder Aston and also as they administer to Anne Marie's mom who's living with them. We lift up Chrissy Watkins too, Lord. Uh, we pray that she will continue to be recovering in a positive way from the surgery that she just had for thyroid cancer. We ask that you be with her and her family as well. We ask a blessing for our speaker today, Elder John Hakasamana, who is coming here from uh, Lake Nelson, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for bringing him here to give us the morning's message today. We ask also that you bless him um, with the message that he's giving us, may you please bless his ministry, bless him and his family, and um, please bless him and give him traveling mercies back and forth today and bless him in his continued ministry to you. We ask all of these things and blessings for our church, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Now it's time to collect this morning's tithes and offerings, and our deaconesses will be collecting this morning's tithes and offerings. Um, do we have a song we can sing while we have um, while we collect uh, the morning's tithes and offerings? Oh, good. How about uh, let's see what did I know it's not a Chris. How about oh come all ye faithful or one thirty two. 132. Let's sing, O oh, Come All Ye Faithful, while we, uh, while we collect this morning's tithes and offerings. Because faithfulness is tithes and offerings, right? Amen. So with the count of three, one, two, three. O oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. O oh, come ye, O oh, come to bed behold him for the king of angels oh come let us adore him oh come let us adore him oh come let us adore him. In Christ the Lord, sing choirs of angels, sing in exaltation, oh sing all ye citizens of heaven above. Glory to God, all oh, in the highest. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for both this honor and this privilege that you've given us to be able to return tithes and offerings to further the work of your kingdom. May you please use these tithes and offerings to bring back Jesus' soon return 
And we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Uh, now we'll have Sister Ursula come up and read this morning's scripture reading, which is being taken from John chapter 21, verses 15 to 19. And after that, Sister Debbie Barnes will give us some special music. I'll be reading from the King James, John chapter 21, 15. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord. Thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou him? Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walk whither thou would. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldst go. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. Before we sing, I, I just want to say, um, Sister Frida, thank you so very, very much for, you know, getting them ready to sing with us this morning. It was a short time, but they did so wonderful thus far, and I just want to say thank you. And thank you, Sarah and Sister Melody. <laughs>
So to honor him, parapapam, when we come, little baby, parapapam, I am a poor boy too, parapapam, Amen. Happy Sabbath. How are you? So as was said, my name is John. I'm a teacher at Lake Nelson Adventist Academy. Uh, I've been there for quite a while now. Um, it was one of those things where God put you in a place and you, you, you had no idea that's where you needed to be. And so God put me there, and uh, today we're talking about uh, the question, how deep is your love? And I, I, I introduced the Lake Nelson connection first because I never knew how deeply you could love people until I started working with children. And then, and then uh, we added high school, and then I started working with teenage children. Uh, and for those of us that remember when we were teenagers, and for those of you that remember when you had a teenager, um, then you truly know what love is. Because you, you, there are those days when you just go like, Ugh! and then you have to remember how much God loves you so you can love those whom he has put under your care. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your love. Thank you for your blessing. Thank you for uh, helping us to understand your word. And I pray, Lord, that you would be with me this morning, that you forgive my sins that you forgive all, us, all of our sins, that you open our hearts and help us to receive your message. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Thank you so much for the scripture reading. Uh, this is one of those uh, scriptures that, that is, is a beloved scripture. Um, and I love it very much because uh, if you know, I don't know if you've ever done this thing where you compare yourself to what the disciples were. 
Uh, if you haven't done that yet, uh, you'd be surprised. So look at the lives of the disciples, look at their characters, and then see some of your character traits to see which of the disciples you might resemble. And I am a combination of Peter and Judas. Somebody should say, Lord, have mercy. So this is Jesus talking to Peter. Peter was brash. Peter was, you know, always stepping forward. And Peter was, was you know, uh, you know uh, if, if, if you had to put a, a, a label on Peter today, you would say that he is very hyperactive. And, and his attention was terrible. So he would have ADHD. You know, he, he, he jumped in first without thinking. And then it was only after that he had put his foot in his mouth that he would realize, oh, maybe there's something to this. Um, so be, before this conversation happens, if you go into Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 22, and Jesus says something, you know, this is God speaking, and he says something to Peter, and, and Peter has the, the nerve to reply back. And, and um, But God, so, so Peter had said to, to, to Jesus, even if all of these people would go away from you, Lord, I will never leave you i am willing to go with you all the way even to death jesus is like okay um, so chapter 22 of luke luke chapter 22 verse 31 and the lord said simon simon indeed satan has asked for you that he may sift you like wheat but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me. Return means what? Return means what? You, you have gone away and now you come back. So Jesus knows that Peter's going to go away. He knows that you and I are going to go away. And so he says, when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. <laughs> but Peter says, ah, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter. The rooster will not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. And there are many ways of denying Jesus. We've all done it. And anyone who thinks that they're not going to, die, to deny Jesus, you're basically fooling yourself like Peter would. I know that I fall into that pattern many, many times. You know, somebody asks you a question and uh, you kind of feel a little bit uncomfortable to reply as Jesus would. So because of that, you deny Jesus. It's not about just saying, I don't know this man. It's not about cursing people out like, I don't know, blah, 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 this man, like Peter did. It's just, we deny Jesus. And Jesus knew that Peter was going to deny him. So he said, when you have returned to me, and how are you going to return to me? Because I'm going to restore you. So this conversation that we're having on the Sea of Galilee on the morning, one morning, we don't know which day of the, of the week it was. It just, we know that uh, it was sometimes after the resurrection. Jesus is restoring Peter. So let's go back to this conversation. If you get a chance to read through the Desire of Ages, chapter 85, I believe. Chapter 85, I think, is, is, is the, the chapter that talks about this. It's called, By the Sea One More Time. Okay? And it connects to the time when Jesus recruited Peter. 
That's in Luke chapter 5. They had been fishing all night. And they caught nothing in Luke chapter 5. So they're at the seashore. Now, if you're a fisherman and you catch nothing, if you are one of those people that gets paid by the hour and that day you did not get to work, if you are one of those people that, that you have to do the job so that you could get paid for the job, you're not just salaried. Uh, if, if, if you're in that category, you work by night as a fisherman and you have caught nothing, that means that day you get no money. That day you, get not, you don't get to bring anything home. And that day when you get home, you feel like you cannot be the provider for your family the way that you want to provide. So they're sitting there. They're mending their nets. I don't know why they're broken if they caught nothing. But okay. Uh, they're mending their nets. And uh, Jesus sees this multitude of people that are pushing towards him. And he asks, can I stand on your boat? And the person he asked was Peter. Peter works with his brother Andrew. He says, okay, sure, no problem. He stands there. Peter has probably heard about Jesus Christ because, you know, the, the, this guy has started to walk. And the reason why there's a big crowd is because people have started to know about Jesus Christ. So he stands on the boat. He preaches this sermon. When he finishes preaching the sermon, which, you know, Jesus always has a plan. I hope you have figured out by now that Jesus always has a plan. Jesus never comes and stands in your boat by accident. Jesus doesn't get you caught into an accident on the road because he just wants to, to have fun with, with you or whatever. He always has a plan. Jesus doesn't come to your house, to your place of work. He, Jesus doesn't uh, enter into your life without a plan. So he entered into Peter's life with a plan. He knows that Peter has gone fishing all night and has caught nothing. He knows that Peter... The brash Peter, the one who brags all the time. I'm sure he brags because, you know, he, he's pretty good at what he does. He does. He's a very good fisherman and he usually catches a lot and he could brag about it. Did you see what I caught today? And he does that because he feels some kind of way that he needs to get that affirmation from people. So he brags about it so that he could get that affirmation from people. If you ever meet someone who, who boasts a lot, typically what might be portraying itself as a very strong ego is actually a very fragile ego. People who talk themselves up a lot are trying to prop themselves up because they know deep down that their self-esteem is low. Uh, Jesus knows this about Peter. Jesus knows that this man needs to feel loved. And he usually tries to get it by himself. And it usually backfires because I'm sure this is not the first night that he's ever not caught something. And then this day is going to be a bad day for Peter because everybody, usually when you talk yourself up and then you crash on your face, then everybody's ready to let you have it. So Jesus comes into Peter's life with a plan. He says, let's go to the deep. How deep is your love? Is the question for today. How deep is your love? The deeper you go into the ocean, the more you need to rely on the safety of the boat. But not just that, because the boat can capsize. The boat can spring a leak. The deeper you go into the ocean, the more you need to depend on God. Even if you're an experienced fisherman, even if you're an experienced sailor, the deeper you go, the more you need to be dependent on God. Deeper love requires deeper dependency. Interestingly, most of us, just like Peter, love to be independent. We want to do things ourselves. We want to be independent. As, as a people, 
We want to be independent. You know, no country wants to be dependent on another country. No city wants to be dependent on another city. And I remember, um, I don't know if you, if, you followed, uh, if you follow what happens in New Jersey, but uh, just before the, the pandemic, so in between 2019 and, tw and 2008, remember 2008, the recession? Um, so the recession and the crisis and everything, um, a lot of municipalities in New Jersey started recombining that those municipalities had incorporated themselves so that they could become independent. What does that mean when a city is independent, when the municipality is independent? It means they can pay their own municipal workers, including their firefighters, including their police force, including some of the sanitation workers, including those municipal jobs that need to be done. So usually when a town feels like they got some money in the pocket or you know some money in the municipality, they will incorporate themselves and they will say, we are an independent town. We are an independent city. And then after the recession, all of these cities realized that they could not sustain that anymore. So they started to consolidate. They started to consolidate. Now, I, don't, I, I haven't looked at the map down here as much. Uh, I mean, do you guys still consider yourself Central Jersey or do you South Jersey? Are you Central? We see you guys are South, but uh, that's okay. Because <laughs> if I have to drive an hour to get to you, I feel like, you know, I'm no longer in the center, but okay. <laughs> Um, but, but so, so, you know, if you, if you look at New Jersey, how we are, some towns are such tiny pieces and then, uh, it, it up where I am. Uh, so you used to have a big town called Edison and then some portions of Edison started incorporating. But what's funny is it's like. This is Edison, this entire church building is Edison, and this pulpit is a township, totally surrounded by Edison. In order for you to get out of your township, everywhere you go, you have to go through Edison. How are you going to say that you are incorporated? It's just a neighborhood that decided that they wanted to be by themselves. They wanted to be independent. I'm bringing that example out to show you how we live as Christians. God owns the entire world. But sometimes, because, you know, I've gotten a good salary now, and, you know, I feel like a good, I, I got a good social network right now, and, you know, my friends are, you know, connected, and I'm connected, and, you know, my children go to good schools, and, and you know, we have good... Uh, you know, retirement plans, and we have all of these good stuff. So, you know, now I feel like I could incorporate myself. So I become an incorporated municipality in the kingdom of God. And I feel that, that I can walk around with independence in the kingdom of God. But guess what? We said that deeper love requires deeper dependency. The more independent you want to be is a revelation of how little love you have for God. I'm going to say that again. The more independent you and I want to be is a direct revelation that we don't love God that much. Because if we loved God and we understood that he owns everything, including this little piece of land that we live on, including this body that we, that we walk around in, he owns all of that. So then how am I going to claim my independence from a God who owns everything? So here you have Peter. We haven't forgotten about Peter. Peter is a very good fisherman. Peter is a master sailor. Peter feels that he owns this boat and the sea. He, he, he feels like the Lake of Galilee, that's his place. He has, he's a master of his domain. But he has caught nothing that night. And Jesus comes to remind him who's the boss. 
He says, let's go to the deep. And Peter said, okay, I mean, you know, uh, we usually fish at night because when it's sunlight, the fish go deeper and we can't get them. So, you know, we go fish at night because they come a little bit closer to the surface. But you're a carpenter and, uh, um, you know, you don't know anything about the ocean. But okay, whatever. You know, people listen to you. I see a crowd of people listening to you. So I'll listen to you for a little bit. But I don't think it's going to work. Doesn't God sometimes ask you to do something and you go like, well, you know, uh, I have a medical degree um, and, uh, and, you know, I've gone for a long time to school and, uh, and then, you know, uh, we have learned in school that this is how it works and you're telling me to lay on this side and it's going to work? It's like, that makes no sense. Or, you know, for me, I'm, I'm a scientist. Uh, I teach physics. I teach mathematics. I like things that are factual. So, you know, even this conversation we're having today about love makes no sense because there's no science behind that. I mean, people could say there's psychology and all that, but even then, that's we don't really have, you know, there's no formula for making this happen. Like, you cannot repeat, you know, like, uh, you know, put this in, in like, like the way that you, you, you create a, a recipe and you know that that recipe is going to work. There's no science behind love. It just happens. And it doesn't happen the same way for everyone. But Peter says, okay, uh, we'll go to the deep. Okay, no problem. Sure. And then Jesus asked him, okay, now cast the nets. Jesus says, cast the nets. Peter says, we have toiled all night and have caught nothing. But at your word, we will cast a net. One. Jesus, um, I do this for a living. I do this every day for a living. I don't understand how you could go tell me that a builder is going to tell me how to do things in the ocean. But, okay, you know what? I'm going to humor you. We're going to cast one net. And you know the story. So much fish that they had to call their partners, their friends. John and James who are working on their father's boat, their father's name is Zebedee. They come and they together, those two boats, pull this net. It was filled with so much fish, it was breaking. Now they had purpose for actually mending the nets. I don't understand why they were mending the nets before, but now they actually have purpose. And immediately he just got reminded who's the boss is right and instead of going like man we should have you every night with us fishing he goes like get out of my boat Peter told God I am so independent that when you show me off in my job I want you to go thank God Thank God that Jesus doesn't listen to us. You know, thank God that sometimes he chooses to not listen to our foolishness. Because he did not listen to Peter. He says, Peter, from now on you will become a fisher of men. I don't think in any other circumstances Peter would have left behind his job. To follow Jesus Christ. And the story in John chapter 21 reminds us of that. Because when Jesus now is dead. And even though they just saw him resurrected. He came and entered the house that they were in. The upper room that they were in. And he said to them, Shalom Aleichem. Peace be unto you. Um, and, and, and then he asked for fish. Um, uh, because they thought he was a ghost. You know, we were talking about ghosts earlier. They thought he was a ghost. I'm like, no, no, I'm not a ghost. I'm a resurrected being. 
And he says, okay, give me some fish to eat. And then he, they gave him some fish to eat. And then a couple days later, when, when Peter is going like, okay, so how are we going to live now? He forgot all of these three years he's been wa uh, walking with Jesus. He forgot about the 5,000. He forgot about the 4,000 and the bread that was left over. He forgot about all of that. And as a matter of fact, they're going fishing at the lake. I, I have been there. And last time I was here, I was showing you pictures of me being there. I have been at that beach, at that lake, which literally is like from here to you cross the street and then now you're on the mountain where he fed the 5,000. And Peter's at that lake, at that same beach where the 5,000 were, were fed. And the reason why it says that uh, they were sitting on the mountain is because it comes off the beach and it goes up, not too steep, but in, enough for you to not be by the water. They're back at the same location. And Peter says, let's go fishing. Because they're going back to their old lives. He's thinking, you know what? Jesus is gone now, or at least he's not directly with us every day. How are we going to live? He goes back to seeking independence. He goes back to trying to do things his own way. And they go back into the boat at night, the sensible hour for preaching, for, 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 for fishing, the sensible time for catching the, the fish because they come to the surface close to the, to the surface at night and they catch nothing. Sometimes I want to be there to hear the conversation between Jesus and the fish. Have you ever, I, 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 my mind goes in those areas too. My, my mind veers in, the, in those kinds of conversations. Could you imagine Jesus telling the fish, okay, guy, guys, um, today we're not going into that net. Right? I mean, it is Jesus. He speaks to all of nature and nature obeys, right? And then when it's time for the fish to go into the nets, he tells the fish, hey, guys, now time to go into the net. And the fish are willing to lay down their lives because the master commanded and they know that he owns them. We as human beings are the ones who are stubborn. We're the ones trying to be independent. I know that Jesus called the fish and told them, you stay away from that boat all night. And they did. And then when the morning comes, I love, I love how E.G.Y. puts it in, in that chapter in Desire of Ages. It says that through the night, they were there working. And on the shore, there was this one lone watcher watching them work. It's not that God abandons us. It's just that we just go do our own thing. And he's there watching, shaking his head. Going like, what are you trying? When are you going to learn? And in the morning, they caught nothing, embarrassed again, and they're coming to the shore. Thankfully, there's not a crowd to witness their embarrassment that time. Before they get to the shore, Jesus is sarcastic. I don't know if you've ever caught that. He goes, children, did you catch anything? And it said, no. Well, throw the nets to the right side. And apparently that happened to be the side that is facing him, that is facing the shore. And as any fisherman knows, the shallow waters don't have as much fish. It made no sense. But Jesus talked to the fish. And Jesus told the fish, get in the net. And 153 of those fish listened. I still don't know why it says 153. I've tried to find out different commentaries and all of that stuff, what the number 153 means. And I have not found a reliable source that tells me 
perfectly with 153 means. But 153 big fish got into that net. And John was the first one to notice. He says, it is the Lord. And Peter, I don't know if he was fishing naked or something like that, because another one that the commentaries don't really explain, but it says that he put on his uh, uh, outer garment, or better yet, he girded his outer garment. Um, and, and, and for those of you who don't understand, if you, whenever they say you gird your loins or something like that, remember, they used to wear dresses. Everybody wore dresses. They didn't have pants, which is weird when we have a conversation and a fight about pants and all the stuff in this church. I don't, I don't get that. They all wore dresses, okay? So now, if you want to run in a dress, if you want to swim in a dress, that's not going to work very well. So what do you have to do? Hold on. If I'm wearing a dress, I have to first pull it up this way and then tie it on my waist so now I have pantaloons. Eh? That's what it means to gird yourself, to gird your loins. So Peter girded his loins so that he could be able to swim. He was impulsive, rash, hyperactive. He couldn't wait for the boat to get to the shore. So he swam. He jumped into the water, swam to the shore, left his friends behind. And the friends rowed the boat to the shore. And then he gets there immediately. There's a reason why he wanted to get to the master so quickly. Because he was so happy to see the master. He remembered that just a few nights back he had betrayed the master. And now he wanted to, to run back and say, I'm sorry. And Jesus knew that he knew. That Jesus knew that Peter was sorry. And Jesus knew that Peter understood that he had messed up. So that's why he asked him the three questions. The question we have for today is, how deep is your love? In the Bible, there are three words that are used for the word love. So in, in English, English is a very weird language. Um, English is a very, what's the word? There isn't a word that could properly define how I think about English. Um, I had to learn English. I grew up in the United, not outside of the United States of America. I grew up in Rwanda. We spoke French and we spoke my native language. So I learned my native language in Kenya, Rwanda. And then, uh, and then I, I learned French, which is more structured. It has its problems, but it's more structured. Uh, and then I started learning English. English has zero structure. Zero structure. And, you know, there, there, and there. You know, that's just, you know, like, uh, and, 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 you know, if, 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 if you want to learn English and you are a foreigner and you're learning it and you find all these rules and all these exceptions and all these things, it's so complicated. And in English, we have several words to mean the same thing. But for this one particular thing, we chose one word to mean different things. Love. So the question is, what does love mean? And how do you describe it? So is, is, if I say I love my mom, the same thing as saying I love pizza? You're laughing, but it's true. Thank you for laughing. That's a, so so, so, so uh, if I love my car... Would that be the same thing as the, the, me loving my brother, my friend, you know, a, a husband loving his wife or a wife loving her husband? Is that the same thing? Is that the same love? No, but in English, it's the same word. So you're stuck with context, context clues. The ancients were not that careless with that word. They had multiple words for what we translate today as love. In the Bible, there's three of those. There's the one that we talk about very often uh, as godly love, as uh, the, the love that God has for us and the love that God wants us to have for one another. That's agape. So agape is that, that 
charitable love that you know the kind of love that you love someone and you want what is best for them even though that means you have to sacrifice something okay the kind of love that would you would never harm that individual because you want them to be safe you want them to be okay you want them to be their best version that's agape we have also a uh, philia philia which comes from philos philos is like a friend okay so i choose to love a friend but you know like the way that i love my friend is not the same way that a husband loves his wife it's not the same thing that god loves us so so you know so that's philia but then you know when when uh it, hopefully hopefully you don't love your friends with a third third one uh, eros eros is you know that's the way we get the, we get from that the word erotic you know that's 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 that 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 physical attraction that strong physical attraction is very sensual it's very it's it's you know it's 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 limited mainly to just the beauty of the body so that's that's eros so we have agape we have philia we have eros but there's another one called storge Storge is the love that family members have amongst themselves. The affection that you have with family members, the, the, the love that a mother would have for her child, the love that a child would have for, for the mother, uh, brotherly love kind of. But, uh, but it's not quite like philia, but it's, 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 it's not quite like agape. So it's kind of somewhere that's in between. So we have agape that's that beautiful love with God, with, with people. We have philia, that's friendship, that's, that's affection, camaraderie. We have uh, eros, that's that, uh, you know, erotic, rom romantic love. Uh, and we also have storge. But then there's this other one that I just learned about this morning, actually, uh, xenia. Xenia is the love for strangers. It's kind of like that obligation that you have to love people just because they showed up, right? So, so sometimes, and children, children, I know you don't understand this one and you question this one because I used to question that and sometimes I still question it. You know, uh, auntie so-and-so is coming. You know those days. And then we got to clean the house. And we got to mop and we got to sweep and we got to do whatever it needs because auntie so-and-so is coming. And I'm like, what? Who is auntie so-and-so? And I don't even know who that person is. And then all of a sudden, auntie so-and-so comes or uncle so-and-so comes. And then, you know, like, uh, first of all, we got to wait to eat before they get here. And not only do we have to wait to eat before they get here, but they get to have the first portions and now I'm having the leftovers. That's Xenia, because it comes from Xenos, Xenos is stranger. So the love that, that we're obligated to have for strangers, that's Xenos, Xenia. Uh, so five levels of love in Greek. And then if you take the philia, remember the philia that I talked about? If you have philautos, that's like auto means self, so you could have self-love. And self-love is could be good nowadays there's a lot of people talking about self-care because you know uh it's important to, to to take care of yourself so it could be good it's important to take care of yourself but it could also you know devolve into something narcissistic so you could have too much self-love and, and and children for those of you who don't know narcissism comes from the story of narcissus who loved his face so much he wanted to look at his face all the time and they didn't have reliable mirrors back then. So the best place he could find to look at his face because he was so in love with his face. The best reflective place to look at his face was this pond. And he wanted to be so close, so close, so close to his face that eventually he drowned. He was looking at his face so much and he drowned in this pond. So, you know, self-love is good when we are being constructive, but self-love could be destructive. And that self-love is sometimes what could lead us to that 
independent spirit. We want to be independent. We feel like, you know, everything is about me and everything is whatever. And, and, and you know, and, but Jesus said something. Jesus said, no servant is greater than the master. If they persecuted me, so shall they persecute you. Now you're probably wondering, why did I go through all that Greek lesson right now at this time, this afternoon, and we got to go home and you're hungry and, and you, you want to have lunch and all of that stuff. Why are we learning Greek? It's because of that conversation at the beach. That conversation at the beach. Remember I told you there's agape, there's philia, there's eros, there's storge, and there's xenia. Right? Agape is the ultimate form of love. Philia is good, really good. It's friendship, it's admiration, it's companionship. In the conversation between Jesus and Peter, they're going back and forth between those two. The first question that Jesus asked, verse 15, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He asked him the question because he's saying he's comparing him to the other ones. He, want to, he wants to see if Peter's still comparing himself to other ones. And the question he asked him was, Agapao me. Do you agape me? Do you love me with that highest form of love? When Peter replied, he says, Yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. Jesus asked him the question about, do you love me with that highest form of love? And Peter replied, I like you like a friend. Jesus asked the question again. Verse 16, he asked him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, agapao me. Do you love me with that highest form of love? And Peter replied a second time, Yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. Do you love me so deeply? Lord, I like you as a friend. You see, if you did not have the Greek lesson, when you read this, it just looks like love. But those are two different levels. Jesus is asking Peter, how deep is your love? And Peter is discovering, or Peter hasn't even understood the question. Peter hasn't even comprehended the depth of love that is required of him. He's only still under the surface. So Jesus, the third time, Instead of asking him, agapao me, he asked him, phileo me. Do you like me as a friend? So instead of asking the question at that very high level, Jesus brought the question slightly lower. Because he also wanted Peter to realize, I asked you the question up here. You haven't reached there yet, so I'm going to come to your level. The third time he asked him, Simon, son of Jonah, phileo me, do you like me as a friend? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you phileo me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I phileo you. You know that I like you. And with each one of these, Peter, uh, G Jesus was telling Peter, feed my lambs, tend my sheep. He's saying, because you love me, do this. And then he gives Peter a glimpse of the future. He says, right now, you're not at the agape level yet. But in the future, you will be. He says, most assuredly, this is verse 18. I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself. That, you know, that girding yourself that we did the demonstration. Uh, you girded yourself and you walked where you wished. 
But when you are old, you will stretch out your hand, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Stretch out your hands means die on a cross. Peter did die on a cross. And because Peter loved Jesus so much, he says, far be it from me to die on the cross the same exact way that Jesus died. Crucify me upside down. He had finally understood agape. He had finally understood that to go deep with God, you must become dependent on God. He finally understood that you could leave everything behind. You do not have to be brash. You do not have to be boastful. You do not have to have your way. You do not have to be independent. He finally understood what it means to love God and to love God deeply. And he became the leader of the church, not because he was boasting, but because he understood that in order for you to lead, you must be the one to sacrifice the most. He understood agape. So the question I'm going to ask you today is, how deep is your love? What municipalities are you willing to give up so that you could be reconciled with God? What independence do you need to give up so that you could love God, not just at the phileo level, but to love him at the agape level? What must you give up today? One of my favorite songs, actually, it's my favorite song in the whole world. It's a love song um, by Stevie Wonder. It's called As. Right? Sometimes they put that in parentheses, always, because he keeps repeating the word always. He says, As around the sun the earth knows she's revolving, and the rosebuds know to bloom in early May, just as hate knows loves the cure, you can rest your mind assured that I'll be loving you always. As now can't reveal the mystery of tomorrow, but in passing will grow older every day. Just as all that is born is new, know that what I say is true. I'll be loving you always. And then he starts saying how deeply that love is. It's like, I will never stop loving you. I will only stop loving you if this happens. He says, I will love you until the rainbow burns the stars out in the sky. Until the ocean covers every mountain high. Until the dolphin flies and parrots live at sea. Until we dream of life and life becomes a dream, I'll be loving you. And here's a part that really touches me, this part, this part, because it goes back to these, how deep is your love? So we all know sometimes life's pains and troubles can make you wish you were born in another time and space. But you can bet your life times that and twice its double that God knew exactly where he wanted you to be placed. So when, make sure when you say you're in it, but not of it. That's a Christian saying, right? I'm in it, but not of it. Because Jesus said we are in it, but not of it. Make sure when you say you're in it, but not of it, you're not helping to make this place into a place sometimes called hell. Change your words into truth and then change that truth into love and maybe our children's grandchildren and their great-grandchildren will tell. I'll be loving you until the rainbow burns the stars out in the sky, until the ocean covers every mountain high, until the dolphin flies and the parrots live at sea, until we dream of life and life becomes a dream, 
Until the day is night and night becomes a day. Until the trees and the seas just up and fly away. And this is one that gets me as a mathematician. Until the day that 8 times 8 times 8 is 4. Until the day that is the day that are no more. Oh, it's a beautiful song. It's a beautiful poem. And I love this song because it challenges us. In order for you to go deeper with God, you must give up those things that you thought were your principles or whatever it is. If they're not founded in Jesus Christ, they have to go. You must give up the things that you thought made you so powerful, so important, so, so, so whatever. Because independence has no room in the kingdom of God. We cannot be independent in the kingdom of God. Yes, we are free. But freedom and independence are not the same thing. If you invite me again, I will tell you about that. So the question again is, how deep is your love? For God and how deep is your love for others because when the when that when the teacher of the law came to ask Jesus he says Jesus what is the greatest commandment and he says the first commandment is this love the Lord your God with all your mind and all your heart and all your strength and the second one is like it love your neighbor as you love yourself. And then later he says, another commandment, a new commandment I give you, love one another. When he says that, he's saying, agapao one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this they will know that you are my disciples. There is nothing else that shows the world how we are Jesus' disciples. He didn't say it's by your worship service. He didn't say it's by keeping the fourth commandment, although we must. He didn't say it's by, it's by the tithes and offerings, although we should. It, he didn't say it is, it is by the way we dress, although we should, we should come presentable. He didn't say it's by the way we eat. He didn't say all of that stuff. He says, by this. People will know that you are my disciples. The only requirement was that we love one another. How deep is your love? Let us pray. Father God, I confess that I have denied you many times. I confess that I have not loved as you have asked. I confess that I have not shown that I'm your disciple. I pray that you forgive me, Lord. I pray that you forgive us where we have decided to be brash like Peter. Forgive us where we have decided that we thought we could be independent like Peter. I, I, I pray, Lord, that you would restore us the same way that you restored Peter. That you would give us that deep sense of love for you and a deep sense of love for others so that we may be able to understand what the kingdom of God is about. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Please stand for the closing hymn number 76. Oh, love that will not let me go. Oh, love that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe. That in thy notion depths its flow may reach her full love. Oh, life.
light that follows all my way. I yield my flickering torch to thee. My heart restores its borrowed ray that in thy sunshine's blaze its day may brighter forever be. O joy that seekest me through pain, I cannot close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain and feel the promise is not vain that morn shall fearless be. O cross that lifteth up my head, I dare not ask to fight from thee. I lay in just life's glory dead. And from the ground there blossoms red, life that shall end must be. Amen. <laughs> Good afternoon, Chair.